Hello, welcome to our brown bag presentation. I'm Elizabeth Reitz with the Office of the State Archaeologist. And um, with us presenting today is Faith Wilfong. So the OSA brown bags are a regular speaker series. Usually they're held at our lab. Uh, and for the foreseeable future, we're going to host them virtually in this format. So thank you for joining us on Facebook and YouTube. Faith is going to give her presentation and then we will have comments at the end. Uh, like our other virtual presentations, if you've attended those. So if you're on YouTube, you can put a question in the comment box. If you're on Facebook, the same thing, put your question in the comment box um, at any time, really. And we'll save the questions for the end. So I'm going to introduce Faith. Um, Faith is a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Iowa. She received her BA in Anthropology and double major in Archaeology from the University of North Carolina in Greensboro in December 2017. During her undergraduate career, Faith traveled to Olduvai Gorge, Tanzania on a research assistantship to complete a small faunal analysis and compare the development of modern landscape assemblages in different microhabitats. Her firm interest in continuing her training as a faunal analyst and a desire to work on the plains of North America led her to apply to work with Dr. Matthew E. Hill from the University of Iowa. In May 2020, Faith completed her MA in Anthropology and submitted a thesis on the proto-period, sorry, proto-historic period fauna from the Scott County Pueblo. Faith is also one of the newest part-time employees at the Office of the State Archaeologist, and we're incredibly happy to have her working there. So her brown bag presentation is analysis of the proto-historic period fauna from the Scott County Pueblo, which is site 14 SC1. And I am going to start her presentation here and I'll pop back in to help with the Q&A. Thanks, Elizabeth. All right. Um, Thank you all for attending this virtual brown bag uh, hosted by the Office of the State Archaeologist. Um, I really appreciate everyone joining me for their lunch hour, and I hope you find this presentation enjoyable and informative. Uh, today, I would like to give you guys a brief lecture on the recently completed analysis of a faunal assemblage from the Scott County Pueblo site in western Kansas. Uh, this research was the core of my master's thesis and training, uh, which, like Elizabeth said, I finished in May of last year. Um, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak about the site itself and the analysis that I completed. And everyone who knows me personally that's watching this uh, knows how much I love anatomy and animal bones. Uh, so hopefully all of you find this as interesting as you know I do and I geek out over. Um, so just a little overview of the presentation. Um, as part of the University of Iowa's investigations into the Scott County Pueblo and surrounding sites, I completed an analysis on the faunal material uh, collected from 14 SC1 by James Gunnarsson in 1965. Uh, my advisor, Dr. Matthew E. Hill, who's at the Department of Anthropology at uh, U Iowa, previously oversaw the analyses of other known faunal assemblages or animal bone collections uh, from the Pueblo. Uh, today, I hope to offer a bit of background information and talk about the history of excavation at 14 SC1, uh, which has actually been the subject of investigation for more than 120 years. I will also discuss the composition of the Gunnarsson faunal assemblage, uh, the results of the taphonomic analysis that I did, and some of our key findings from both this collection and the total faunal assemblage at uh, 14 SC1. And I will conclude with some future directions for the research, and there will also be time at the end uh, for you guys to um, comment and ask questions. So, uh, the Dismal River complex represents the long-term indigenous occupation of the Western Plains between 1300 and 1700 AD. Uh, this complex is recorded from approximately 250 sites in Wyoming, Nebraska, Colorado, uh, and Kansas. And these sites currently offer the best archeological evidence for an ancestral Apache or Nidi uh, occupation of the central Great Plains. The Scott County Pueblo 
um, or the site of 14SE1, is situated on the eastern edge of the High Plains in western Kansas. This site is best known for the presence of a seven-room masonry pueblo, uh, which is the furthest northeast a pueblo has been uncovered in North America. Due to the unique archaeological presence of both Puebloan and Ancestral Plains Apache Needy cultural materials, uh, the site of 14 SE1 has often been interpreted as the location of El Cortalejo, which is a historically documented um, Apache settlement in the Great Plains where Puebloan peoples fleeing um, the Rio Grande resided um, as colonization from the Spanish moved into their ancestral lands. Uh, recently, however, uh, researchers at the University of Iowa and their collaborators have discovered through new radiocarbon dates and the reanalysis of the artifact collections um, that the Scott County Pueblo and surrounding sites uh, were occupied for a much longer period than previously suggested by colonial accounts. In fact, um, it appears that the site of 14 SC1 was originally inhabited by Dismal River peoples between AD 1470 and 1640, which could be centuries earlier than other well-known Dismal River sites in Nebraska and Kansas. Later, sometime between AD 1630 and 1660, uh, Puebloan migrants uh, arrived from New Mexico and constructed the Pueblo, which is consistent with the Rio Grande um, Puebloan ceramic types discovered at the site and the limited local production of Puebloan vessel forms and types that we find here. So we therefore argue that the site and surrounding region were eventually occupied by a multi-ethnic, multi-generational community of Plains and Puebloan peoples. Um, interestingly, the Pueblo was also closed through ritual burning uh, by AD 1696, uh, which is earlier than expected given the presumed connection to the movement of Pueblo and migrants um, out of the Rio Grande after the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. So a little bit about the excavation history, um, just to give you some background. Um, first, it's really important to further kind of our collective understanding of 14 SE1 and these surrounding sites because the impacts of Spanish colonization on the lives of indigenous peoples uh, were felt well beyond the colonial centers in the Southwest. Furthermore, uh, needy residents and Puebloan descendants lived in integrated communities in the region even after the closure of the Pueblo. So with the excavation history, formal investigations of the Pueblo were initiated by paleontologists uh, Samuel Willington and Handel T. Martin in 1899. The unusual presence of a masonry Pueblo, uh, charred corn and Pueblo and pottery led these researchers to believe the site represented the locality of El Cortalejo. Um, in 1939, however, Smithsonian archeologist uh, Waldo, Waldo Wadel uh, began his investigations of the site, uh, primarily immediately north of the Pueblo with some excavation to the south, and he rejected Williston and Martin's presumptions about the connection there. Wadel instead uh, noted a lack of Puebloan artifacts from his excavations and highlighted the similarities between the Nidi cultural remains he had uncovered with cultural finds from the Dismal River sites in western Nebraska. Uh, then later, in the summer of 1965, uh, James H. Gunnarsson enters the scene and he excavated areas to the north, west, and southwest of the Pueblo. Um, and so while I'll discuss, discuss those investigations more in just a minute, um, it's important to note here that Gunnarsson interpreted 14 SE1 as a Cortalejo Apache village or perhaps even um, an 18th century trading post built by Pueblo and auxiliaries. Uh, so after Gunnarsson, uh, beginning in 1970, uh, Tom Witte of the Kansas State Historical Society uh, led a complete re-excavation re of the Pueblo and opened large block excavations to the Southwest. And you can see all of these on my uh, graph to the left of the screen. Um, the cultural remains that Witte uncovered, along with the discovery of a roasting pit beneath one of the Pueblo wall, uh, walls, 
led Witte to accept that there were actually multiple occupations of 14SE1. And then over the last 10 years, uh, researchers from the University of Iowa have led efforts to reanalyze the museum collections and excavation records to better understand the cultural identity of the site inhabitants, um, examine the site chronology, and obtain new dates, and identify if any connections actually exist between the Scott County Pueblo and other nearby Dismal River sites. Uh, there are several publications out there uh, by Matthew Hill, Margaret Beck, and Sarah Traber if viewers are interested in reading more um, about these continued investigations. Um, and so this faunal analysis that I completed um, was part of the continued investigations into 14SC1 or the Scott County Pueblo. So a little bit more about Gunnarsson's excavation in 1965. Um, with funding from Northern Illinois University and the National Science Foundation, Gunnarsson excavated um, this site and his investigations focused heavily on areas immediately north of the Pueblo um, in the same general area excavated by Waldo Wadel in, in the 1930s. And Gunnarsson excavated nearly 50 meters southwest of the Pueblo as well. Um, there was also a single excavation unit uh, placed due west, which you can kind of see way out there as feature 17 on the graph. Um, from the information available to us, it appears that some of Gunnarsson's excavation units uh, to the north of the Pueblo, particularly what Gunnarsson calls feature seven, encountered Wadel's first test pit. And recent dating of feature str str stratigraphically, that's a word, stratigraphically <laughs> below the flo floor of the Pueblo, uh, as indicated by Wadel, suggests an occupation of the site between AD 1490 and 1650, um, perhaps a century or so before the Pueblo's existence. Uh, these features would therefore be associated with a Dismal River occupation, um, or what we now know is a ancestral patchy ED occupation. Uh, so due to the similarity in the depth and spatial positioning, of the units, uh, our current working hypothesis is that Gunnarsson, Gunnarsson's excavations to the north of the Pueblo are actually associated with the original Dismal River occupation, just like Wadel's units. Uh, similarly, excavations to the southwest of the Pueblo, uh, particularly a shallowly buried um, use surface, are comparable to Witte's excavations uh, in the southwest. Witte's deposits um, in the area of the site uh, to the southwest were recently dated and found to be contemporary with the Pueblo occupation. Um, our current understanding of Gunnarsson's excavations to the southwest also lead us to believe that his units are contemporary uh, with the habitation of the Pueblo. So multiple things going on at 14 SC1. Um, by the time I started the analysis of the fauna for my master's degree, uh, the ceramics and lithics were already analyzed. Um, there are some complications with our investigations into all of the Gunnarsson er, collections. We're uncertain whether Gunnarsson screened his back dirt uh, because there are no surviving field notes or excavation forms. Uh, the provenience information is also quite limited with only a single hand-drawn excavation map available. Um, however, there, the information we, get, we can gather from his assemblages still contribute to a holistic understanding of the site. Um, and Gunnarsson did donate the collection to the Kansas State Historical Society uh, later in, in his life, and um, KSHS counted and weighed the remains before I started working on them um, while they were on loan uh, to the University of Iowa. And I again, primarily focused on, or only focused on, the fauna uh, associated with Gunnarsson's excavations. So let's talk about bones, uh, my favorite part. <laughs> uh, the preliminary investigation of Gunnarsson's faunal assemblage began in the fall of 2018, which is when I started at the University of Iowa, uh, though most of the work was completed during the 2019-2020 academic year, before the write-up of my thesis. Uh, taxonomic identification or the identification of the animal species or an equivalent label or body size uh, was made by both myself and my advisor, 
uh, using the University of Iowa Comparative Collections and published skeletal identification guides. Um, the basic unit, uh, which we call NSP, or total number of specimens, uh, was used to assess the composition of this assemblage. That is to assess what sorts of animals are present, uh, which you can see in this table here. Uh, skeletal element frequencies and other derived measurements uh, were calculated using anat anatomical landmark quantification. Uh, so a landmark is just a distinct feature on a bone, such as the bony crest you feel um, on your shin or the head of your femur that fits into a socket in your hip. Uh, those are landmarks, and we can use those to learn more about an assemblage. As you can see here, the 1965 Scott County Pueblo faunal assemblage uh, consists of 7,209 specimens, uh, which is nearly 40 kilograms of bone. Uh, due to the heavy fragmentation of the assemblage, 5,406 specimens were indeterminate, uh, which is 75% by count, but actually only 19% of the total mass. Uh, this is um, expected because larger fragments of bone with intact landmarks are often the easiest to identify. Uh, so thus, we do have a smaller portion of the assemblage that could be identified to taxonomic category like species, genus, family, um, or order, and assigned um, even to a body size category if we can't go smaller than that. Uh, however, it's clear that a variety of species were present in the assemblage, and our analysis suggests animals like bison, deer, pronghorn, and turtle uh, were important calorically to the site's occupants, uh, which I'll discuss um, a bit more later. So taphonomic observations, which help us understand the formational history of an assemblage, were also made during uh, my analysis. This included collecting data on the presence, type, and location of weathering damage, uh, bone breakage, humanly induced impacts, uh, butchery marks, burning, carnivore gnawing, um, rodent gnawing, root etching, any other modification you can think of uh, to the outer surfaces of bones. Um, essentially, it was a process of figuring out how the collection of bones formed either through cultural or no non-cultural means. Um, this part of the discussion focuses on remains from the excavation units and not so much the surface finds because we don't have as much provenience information for those. Um, and additionally, I kind of want to focus a moment on natural processes because these natural modifications can reduce our ability to understand human modifications. Um, and so it's important to be aware of their presence before you form any assumptions about the cultural use of animal bones. Uh, so just as some information from this, uh, before remains are buried, bones are exposed to the air and sun, which can damage the cortical surfaces or the outer surfaces of bones. The degree of bone weathering is not always linearly, linear words, not always linearly cor correlated with absolute times of exposure because other factors such as regional climate or vegetation um, can actually affect the appearance of weathering damage. However, over the years, uh, archaeologists have developed a means of tracking approximately how long uh, remains are exposed to the surface and whether bones are relatively st uh, stationary while on the surface. Uh, based on the observations made uh, during my analysis, we know at least some of the assemblage was exposed on the surface for an extended period, but that weathering damage is limited overall, and the bones were relatively stationary prior to burial. So on a related note, if you look at figure two, um, in certain vegetative areas, uh, buried bones are exposed to root etching. So plant roots uh, can leach weak acids that leave thin grooves on the outer surfaces of bones. Uh, these grooves can obscure the presence of cut marks um, or impact marks. Uh, luckily for us, overall, the damage from root etching was relatively modest for the Gunnarsson collection, um, and it's not expected to have drastically altered the assemblage in a negative manner. Uh, the deeply buried northern deposits did have less overall root damage than the more shallowly buried ones to the southwest. 
To continue a little bit uh, from the taphonomic analysis, we also know that carnivores had access to some of the assemblage. Uh, so you can see my cat Tuba here on the left uh, has captured a small bunny and is uh, gnawing on it. It's just a stuffed bunny, so no worries. Um, carnivore gnawing can leave punctuation marks, um, uh, pitting and crenulated edges, um, and rodent gnawing can actually leave small symmetrical channels on the surfaces of bones. While only one bison metacarpal showed evidence for rodent damage, 13% of the specimens coded for gnawing uh, from all excavation areas uh, showed evidence for carnivore marks. Uh, these marks were primarily found on the artiodactyl remains like bison and pronghorn. And while the agent is technically unknown, we expect that domesticated dogs, um, given their present at, presence at the site and known presence at dismal river sites in general, are likely a culprit here for some of the carnivore gnawing that we see. Uh, similarly, of the bones coated for breaks, 79% showed evidence for fresh green breaks. Uh, so green breaks occur perimortem or around the time of death. Uh, these breaks can be the result of intentional use by humans for access uh, to fat in the medullary cavities, um, but can also be caused by extensive gnawing by carnivores, uh, which I'll talk about more in just a bit as well. This all being said, um, despite the fact that some of the assemblage was certainly altered by these natural processes and heavy fragmentation, there was still a portion of the assemblage in relatively good shape with potential to inform us about prey choice, carcass butchery, and transport decisions made by the residents of 14 SE1. Uh, we have, for example, a portion of the assemblage with clear evidence for burning damage, human impact marks, and butchery cut marks, which you can see here in this table. We can also infer how certain species were used by the site occupants or brought into the site via um, our general analysis of the remains um, and by comparisons with previous data that we have or related sites in the area. Uh, so for example, uh, we tentatively identify the small canids in this assemblage as coyotes and the large canids as domesticated dogs. Uh, these attributions are supported by the size and morphology of the bones that I looked at, um, but also preliminary DNA analyses of other canid remains from the Scott County Pueblo. We know domesticated dogs were present at 14 SE1 and other dismal river sites, and some canid remains from this site uh, even show evidence for burning. Uh, we know that butchery marks have been found on canid remains at other dismal river sites, um, and it appears that domesticated dogs were butchered and eaten at the Scott County Pueblo as well. Um, this is not expected, unexpected, I'm sorry, given many groups across North America turn to the consumption of dogs during periods of resource stress, uh, but may have also recognized a powerful symbolic act of eating dogs during ceremonies. Um, so this is just one example of kind of cultural information that we can gather from faunal remains at archaeological sites. Uh, for this presentation, though, I want to focus the rest of discussion on the use of larger mammals, um, particularly bison, for their caloric value. So um, as previously discussed, the archaeological deposits excavated by Gunnarsson immediately north of the Pueblo um, likely predate its construction and rep represent the original Dismal River occupation of the site. And then the deposits to the southwest of the Pueblo um, likely accumulated during the occupation of the Pueblo itself and were produced by a multi-ethnic community of ancestral Apache, Nidi, and um, Puebloan residents. Interestingly, both the northern and southwestern excavation areas have roughly the same composition of fauna in terms of overall sample size and types of taxa present. In fact, uh, bison and unidentified large mammal remains, which based on their morphology and what's available in this area are likely bison, um, are distributed evenly between the southwestern and northern excavation areas. There are also at least five individual bison represented in each area. Uh, this is based on the right distal humeri in the southwest and left proximal ulna is in the north. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with uh, faunal analysis and these measurements that we take, 
um, saying a minimum number of individuals uh, is just a measure of how many bison would need to be accounted for uh, for the skeletal parts present. So if each bison only has one right humerus, for example, in a perfect situation, if I have five complete right humeri, then I've got at least five bison uh, present in the assemblage. Um, so kind of related, uh, both areas are dominated by the same skeletal parts from bison, uh, which you can see here in this graph on the screen. Uh, this means that it's safe to assume these are unrelated assemblages, even if our assumptions about the stratigraphic and age differences between excavation areas are incorrect. So, for example, if the two areas had different abundances of certain body parts, such as the north being dominated by axial elements and the south being dominated by limb elements, uh, then it might have been possible that the remains were acquired at the same time, but differential deposits um, were made when body part choices um, and differences in where the body parts are going led to differences in the assemblage composition. However, this is not the case with the Gunnarsson assemblage, as you can see by the graph. Uh, the skeletal element frequency patterns for the bison remains in the two areas are very similar. So we expe expect um, or suspect the assemblages were deposited independently and likely at different times of occupation for 14 SC1. Uh, a kind of other, a new way of looking at this, um, you can see this bison here, to maximize sample size and because bison abundance and skeletal part representation are very similar for the northern and southwestern excavation areas, we actually combine the entire bison assemblage from both parts of the site and included large, um, unknown large mammal remains to discuss the use, transport, and carcass processing of the bison. Um, it's acknowledged here that uh, deer, pronghorn, dogs, and turtle, like I said earlier, uh, were likely important prey species for the site occupants, but their small sample sizes um, did not really warrant a detailed analysis of butchery and transport like the bison remains did. Uh, so we know that bison were butchered and used for consumption during um, or due to the abundant presence and distribution of cut marks and impact marks across the remains. A total of 18 distinct elements had a total of 54 cut marks on them. And then we had 45 distinct elements with um, a collective total of 164 human impact marks. So they're clearly being used. Um, the butchery marks were most often found on the shafts and ends of the major limb bones, uh, many of which are considered high utility skeletal parts like the humeri, the radii, uh, femora, and tibiae. Uh, this suggests that the most intensely used bison bones were actually carcass pot parts with um, lots of fat and tissue. Uh, the assemblage itself is also dominated by upper limb bones. So you can see here uh, scapula, humeri, um, ulnae, and femora are kind of darker. That means we had more of them. Um, but we had a poor representation of axial skeletal elements and distal limb elements like phalanges or your fingers. Um, as it can often be difficult to assess um, which agents or processes are responsible for the differential abundance of remains in an assemblage, Skeletal element frequencies can be compared with models for economic utility um, and natural site formation processes. Uh, so essentially, zooarchaeologists can use these statistical models uh, that have been developed to assess whether there are significant relationships between skeletal part abundance and measures like caloric yield or between abundance and a bone's ability to withstand destruction because of its density. Uh, so we did a series of connections here, um, statistical models. In the case of the Gunnarsson faunal assemblage from the Scott County Pueblo, the only statistically significant relationship is the moderate positive correlation between Emerson's modified um, average skeletal fat index and um, our percent MAU portion for bison. Uh, so those of you watching, what you really need to understand here is not uh, all the statistics and the numbers, but that these results suggest that hunters prefer preferentially selected certain economically valuable skeletal parts from bison to transport back to camp at 14 SE1, as well as processed and discarded those remains at the site. 
Um, further, elements with lower utility, um, including those attached to high-ranked body parts, were often left at the kill site. Um, further analysis um, that we conducted uh, using another method of measurement to explore the relationship between economic utility and density-mediated destruction uh, suggests that at least for the high-utility body parts, uh, density-mediated density destruction did influence some of the skeletal part representation. Uh, therefore, it could be that once high-value limb elements were present at the Pueblo site, further carcass processing and non-human agents uh, differentially damage the low-density portions of those body parts. Um, however, it's clear that differential destruction alone does not explain skeletal element abundance for bison. There's something else going on. So some key findings, uh, just to summarize and kind of simplify some of the information in this presentation, um, I wanna briefly discuss some of these uh, key findings from our faunal analysis and in the investigation. Uh, first, the entire assemblage uh, clearly has a complex formational history and was difficult to work with due to the high degree of fragmentation, which you saw very early on in the presentation. Uh, data was certainly lost to breakage, um, both modern and archaeological, and a series of natural uh, modifications to the bones, so like the root etching. Our taphonomic analysis and study of cultural use is also biased towards portions of the collection that are generally larger in size and better preserved, uh, particularly the bison and large-bodied animal remains. Um, the limited abundance of very small and small body prey, small animals and small body prey may also be due to potential sampling and preservation bias. Um, however, we have um, quite a bit of data that we were able to work with, and we do know some things about the use of fauna by the occupants of 14SE1 and see similarities even in the subsistence strategies used between time periods. Um, valuable bison skeletal elements with lots of marrow and tissue were clearly brought back to the camp. And we also know, again, that there was an emphasis on the use of dogs, turtles, and artiodactyls in general. So what really happened at 14 SE1? What does Gunnarsson's assemblage uh, contribute to our understanding of the use of fauna by the site's occupants? Um, my analysis suggests the residents of the Scott County Pueblo had a broad diet um, and used an array of prey species, but turtle, artiodactyls, especially bison and canids, um, likely dog, were the most economically valuable. Some species found at the site, which I didn't heavily discuss, discuss in this presentation, um, may have been brought into the site for symbolic reasons um, or via trade. Uh, so for example, I have um, some complete uh, bighorn premolars uh, and a raptor talon. Uh, further, the economic choices made by residents for the transport and butchery of the remains influence skeletal representation at the site. Uh, we suspect bison, uh, as well as pronghorn and deer, were probably not found in the immediate vicinity of 14 SE1. Uh, small groups of hunters would have had to travel some distance from camp uh, to kill large body prey. Uh, smaller prey, especially turtle, uh, were likely obtained from the nearby stream. Um, and then to deal with limited labor during hunts, especially for bison kills, uh, portions of the carcass would have been brought to 14SE1 for further processing and consumption. It's likely that hunters uh, dismembered bison skeletons at major points of articulation and transported only the most valuable parts back to camp. And for very small hunting parties, it seems plausible that not even entire intact legs were brought back to camp. So hunters may have removed uh, the less valuable lower limbs and feet. Uh, the high degree of fragmentation may also be the result of further intense processing back at the campsite itself. Bones may have been further broken or dismembered for direct consumption, access to marrow, or to fit into pots for boiling and fat extraction. Uh, there were hardly any complete bones in the assemblage, and it's clear that major bison limb bones uh, were broken for marrow extraction, uh, which I talked briefly about with breakage, um, but I have longer uh, articles that we can talk about if you, um, or papers that I've written if you want to talk about that later. 
Um, there seems to be similar subsistence strategies also used by residents of 14 SE1 throughout the history of occupation. Um, it's likely Puebloan occupants adapted to their surroundings and harvested flora and fauna available to them, just like the Dismal River peoples. And large game procurement was clearly an important part of this site's formation. So that's kind of what's going on in 14 SE1. Uh, future for directions for research, uh, as you can see, the cute little baby bison. Um, the University of Iowa's involvement with the Scott County Pueblo and surrounding Dismal River sites is ongoing. Um, I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to be a part of a much broader research project. Um, a more detailed manuscript is being submitted very soon, and I'm very excited. Uh, and I hope to see this data and work published in the future. Um, these findings should be used in a broader discussion about the history of occupation and uh, subsistence strategies in this region moving forward. And Matt and I have an interest in which cultural tradition uh, Puebloan or Plains most influence some of these Dismal River foodways and cuisine. And it's also important to understand uh, the role of the Scott County Pueblo within a larger context of Plains um, and Puebloan occupations and movements between these two regions. Um, and the next step is to obtain dates for the Gunnarsson fauna and more soundly determine the relationship between the deposits to the north and the southwest of the Pueblo. Um, so I know that was kind of brief, but I just wanted to give you guys an overview during your lunch hour. Uh, thank you so much for your time and thank you for the OSA for providing a platform for me to speak about this research. And a huge thank you to my advisor uh, for keeping me sane during my master's thesis uh, and the UI anthropology department. Um, so if you guys have questions, uh, I said viewers can comment via Facebook Live, but I see that YouTube is working as well. So uh, if you have questions, just let me know. Yeah, I'll pop back in and help moderate. Um, if you have a, a Google sign in and you're signed into YouTube, you can add a question there or um, Facebook Live as well. So we'll leave face slides up just in case anybody has a question that she needs to go back to a slide. But we did have a couple come in. So um, Tyler White is asking, given the smaller areas of the dig sites away from the main structure of the site, is it possible that there could be different fauna in the uncovered portions or is it predicted to be similar? Uh, that's a good question. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, you know, there there's always going to be portions of the site that are probably left behind. You know, we gather samples that give us information and uh, we try to get as much as we can out of these sites. Um, but a lot of times, you know, we can't gather everything. Um, it's definitely possible there could be different fauna. You know, I talked about the fact that some of the lack of small bodied animals that we have, like muskrat, um, you know, and other rodents, um, it's definitely possible that there's other fauna in those uncovered portions. Um, but, you know, that would require more investigation uh, to find out. Um, I don't know if it would necessarily be predicted to be similar. It's predicted to be similar in the sense that a lot of the animals we see used as prey species depend on what's available for people to gather in the area. Um, but, you know, stuff does get entered into sites via trade as well. So I hope that answers the question. Bill Green is asking, is there any information about pre-horse plains Apache bison hunting methods from other sites? Any kill sites or seasonal patterns? Pre-horse plains. Yes. Um, and I'm trying to think, I know there is, but I honestly can't speak to them at the moment. That might be something we have to talk about, uh, one-on-one -on -one later. Um, but you know, a lot of hunting was going on well before the horses were introduced to the area. And in particular, some of this fauna, you know, it's called the proto-historic fauna because this is happening before a uh, European colonization into kind of Western Kansas and the plains and stuff. It's only happening um, in the South. So we're seeing effects uh, further out and that's why it's important to study, but we don't have um, widespread horses, for example, by this point. Um, 
So yeah, we can talk about that more for sure. <laughs> Okay, Wendy Sandstrom is asking, has there been any genetic analysis? Obviously bones were the focus for the study. What about other items like shells, heights, hair, et cetera? That's a good question. Um, so I previously uh, just briefly mentioned this early on in the presentation, um, but my advisor, Matt Hill and uh, Margaret Beck, and then some of their collaborators have done DNA analyses on some of the bones. So we do know, for example, that the smaller canids at 14SC1 um, are likely coyote, while the larger canids are domesticated dogs. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if there has been any other genetic analyses. Um, they're always great, but expensive to run. So um, that's a good question. <laughs> There's lots of um, positive comments. Thank you for the presentation. So I'm sorting through those for questions. Maria asks, any evidence of economic interactions between the Spanish or French? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I actually don't know off the top of my head, um, but just as kind of a brief thing for people watching who are not, um, you know, super familiar with archeology span and just find it interesting, uh, we do have, you know, different European groups moving into North America in different areas. Um, so, you know, this one I'm focusing on kind of how Spanish colonization is affecting uh, Puebloan peoples in the Southwest. And then even further out, you know, all these occupation movements and coming together and tearing apart uh, multi-ethnic communities um, and kind of what that means for the economics of the people living at those sites, the indigenous peoples. Um, but I'm not actually sure if there's any economic interactions between the Spanish or French. Uh, so I apologize for that. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> okay, have other Dismal River sites been investigated nearby, um, like in the Ladder Creek Valley? If so, do they show any different patterns in bison hunting? That's a good question. Um, so lots of Dismal River sites in that area have been looked at. Um, we do see similar patterns um, so far from what I remember of, um, you know, people hunting the larger game further away and then bringing them in. So bison are not directly in the vicinity, vicinity of these sites all the time. You have to go get them and bring them back. Um, but yes, there's several publications out there on um, or at least mentions of them in other publications of Dismal River sites uh, that have been investigated um, I'm not very good with all of the numbers, but there's a lot of them. Uh, if you look up uh, Matthew E. Hill or Margaret Beck um, or Sarah Trabert, who's actually at the University of Oklahoma now, um, they have publications out. And Sarah Trabert's still working on a lot of this stuff as well. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, just to comment back to the trade question, Veronica says there was an iron axe head. That's awesome. Um, I didn't oh. know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know anything more about that, unfortunately. A lot of OSA staff, especially in IAS members, are commenting that you did a really great job, Faith. This was uh, a fabulous presentation. And um, I'll just I'll remove this. But thank you for, for being brave to put yourself out there virtually. Oh, another question from Bill Green. Uh, Oh, um, he meant pre-contact dismal river. Okay, um, so similar, Laura. So, can you say more about hunting methods and seasonality from co the Coibo component? Sure. So, um, hopefully, I don't get any of this wrong because I think my advisor is watching. <laughs> um, but um, from what I remember about the other sites that have been looked at, and what Matt and I have talked about with the fauna. Um, a lot of these are uh, campsites, um, and obviously with the Pueblo structure, we have kind of um, long-term occupation of a site um, being there for a longer period of time. So seasonality-wise, um, gathering animals um, all year round, or at least most of the year. Uh, we actually had an interesting conversation about uh, whether turtles hibernated or not, and um, if we could gather more um, turtle remains and kind of see um, if there's like seasonal gathering of turtles from this nearby stream. 
Uh, so seasonality wise, you know, we've got people living there long term. Um, hunting methods, again, you know, we have evidence that um, it was pretty small groups of hunters going out to gather kind of the larger bison. And we do see um, or sometimes pronghorn and deer. And so we do see a differential transport at um, a couple of these sites. Um, I don't want to speak too much to this without going back through the publications and saying something wrong. Um, but patterns are similar from what I remember. Um, but yeah, I that's my fault. I should go back and check on those uh, before I say anything more and get it wrong. <laughs> You're definitely not expected to know everything, that's for <laughs> sure. Uh, so I just want to give a shout out to all of the Iowa Archaeological Society members who are tuned in. There were definitely a lot of people watching on YouTube. So thank you for that. We hope to have more brown bags this season. So if you're an archaeology scholar who has some sort of connection to Iowa, whether you research in Iowa, you lived in Iowa, or you even know one of us in Iowa, we're happy to have you present. Just get in touch with the Office of the State Archaeologist. Maria Schrader is our organizer of the Brown Bags. And you will hear about any future live streams on Facebook and through social media. But also if you join the Iowa Archaeological Society, you'll be on the listserv and get notified of all the talks as well. Um, a couple more, they were, <laughs> thank you. So lots of thank yous coming in from the comments. Um, we appreciate you taking your time to share this with us, Faith, and we appreciate all of you who tuned in to view. So we're going to end the broadcast now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>